Welcome to our episode of Biblical Archaeology, From the Ground Down. Presented by Bible Interact and hosted by Dr. George Sparks. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of the Bible from leading experts in the field of archaeology. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Graves, an experienced Biblical archaeologist and CEO of Electronic Christian Media. I'm here today with another exciting episode on our Archaeology Discoveries channel, where we discuss important archaeological artifacts related to the Bible. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody to today's program. This is Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down, sponsored by Bible Interact. Today's guest is Dr. David Graves, and our subject matter is going to be one of the Assyrian kings called Teglath Pelazer III. Teglath Pelazer III. This is going to be the beginning of six different Assyrian kings that uh, Dr. Graves is going to talk about. He received his PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He has been overseas working in the Near East for well over, what, 30 years, has excavated at Tel El MacArthur, a candidate for Biblical Eye, Biblical Shiloh, and everybody knows where Shiloh is Shiloh, no debates about that. Also, he's worked at a tell in Jordan called Tel El Hamam, a candidate, many believe it is, Sodom and Gomorrah. Which one? Sodom or Gomorrah? Sodom? Sodom. <laughs> So glad to have him. Also, look at the books behind him on the bookshelf. He's an author of over 30 books, as well as publications of journals. He was just showing me one of his more recent academic books. Can I don't know. Can you bring that up to show everybody? You're, this is the most academic book. He's, he's developed this from his Ph.D., took him years, and I, I, he showed it to me today, and Hopefully, he can bring it up for everybody. It is Dr. Graves. You didn't even say doc, illustrated by you didn't call yourself doctor on this one. No, I didn't. <laughs> it's David E. Graves, Biblical Archaeology, Old Testament, coloring book, ages 4 to 14. So, people, keep your eyes out for one of the most academic books Dr. Graves has written to date. Is this your 31st book? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And I'm sure Lost the rest count. of them are not quite as academic as this. And we went through and look at some of his pictures. It has to do with, of course, coloring pictures and artifacts, which have been excavated. Some of the most popular artifacts out there that are relative to the biblical narrative. Let's put it that way. Ages 4 to 14. I feel left out because I'm closing on 66. Well, you, know, you know, I guess... A lot of adults like the color too, and uh, there's enough detail in them that you can uh, you can take your coloring pencils out and your color pens and do uh, and do your coloring as well. But uh, um, there's actual photographs of each of the artifacts, um, along with a little bit of a description about the artifact, and then there's a coloring plate uh, that sets the stage for each of the artifacts. And uh, fun for kids and uh, something that they'll uh, enjoy and learn uh, about the Bible and about archaeology along the way. So, Right. Well, I thought one of the qualifiers. There you go. Before Christmas. That's a, a great Christmas gift, no doubt. Hey, I thought one of the qualifications to be able to purchase the book is you got to be able to get the, your birth date, how many years you've been around, your birth years. Actually on the cake. Now, you can't use numbers. you got to use candles. Now, if you could put your birth years in candles on the cake, you qualify for this book. If you can't, well, I don't I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> yeah, well, it's now, a little, little new project. I've got the Old Testament out, and uh, maybe next year I'll do the uh, new, new Testament, Lord willing. There's about right. 30, I think there's 32 coloring plates 32 objects that uh, i deal with uh in the um in the coloring book so uh something for the children to enjoy and uh new venture for me i wonder if you got a a, a, a coloring book for anybody in aarp 
<laughs> Not yet. But, okay. Anyway, folks, I want he just showed me this. I want to share it with you. Biblical archaeology coloring book, ages four to fourteen, and it's got a lot of good information and in, uh, as far as actual coloring, and and then the actual artifact next to the pictures, and uh, it was a good idea. I like yeah. it. Hopefully, you'll have it out soon. All right, and, the, and today once again we're going to be talking about Peglath Palazer. I, I threw him off on this one, folks. So Tiglath. Palasar or Tiglath Pelasar. It's pronounced differently. Um, but that's not how he said it in Ohio. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the third. Uh, we got the third about. part. We can all do that equally as good. Whoever it is, the third. <laughs> Talking about him invading Israel. So this is my uh, AI impression of of the scene. But we're going to be talking about some real live artifacts, not AI generated stuff, as some people have have suggested. So these these are the real deals. The photographs I've taken at the British Museum, and we're going to talk about his annals or his history, his documents yeah. that document what he did. Before I'm going to let people in on this. But before you get going, we were talking about you know you got AI of course. These these slides you actually did yourself. They're, I believe they're really good. I really enjoy them. And we were accused, we were accused of the whole podcast being animated. Me, me, and you being animated. Now, maybe I should take that positively. That that I actually we're actually popular enough to be cartoons now. That that's pretty cool. Well, George, so, I don't. I don't think AI has a sense of humor like ours. <laughs> but, yeah, we got accused of being completely 100% AI. It's just like, don't you guys do anything real? It's all AI generated. I don't think you can fake that. So <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of hard for AI to, to actually generate the quality of glow that I got going on here up in this place. So... We were just looking at an. This is the AI generated one. I like to get uh, and give people a sense of of the context of what it would, would would be like. And AI does a pretty good job on that. Not always, but so I I do a lot of uh, to get this kind of an image. I probably do about uh, twenty others that aren't satisfactory because I know what it should look like. So. Uh, this is one from the British Museum. This is the chariot, horses, a couple of servants leading the horses, umbrella over the chariot. It's difficult to get anything close to that in AI. So this is one that's actually etched in stone in the British Museum. And uh, the material today is based on my book on the archeology span of biblical people under which I mentioned tiglath Pilasar. Now he's mentioned in the Bible. Here is the chronology, the family tree, Neo-Assyrian. So you'll notice that we're talking about tiglath Pilasar the third, and then we're gonna talk about Shamanassar the fifth, Sargon the second, Sennacherib, Ezra Haddon, and Ashurbanipal, because they are mentioned in the Bible. So. Uh, Tiglath Palasar today, and then his relatives will be talking about all mentioned in scripture. That's what the character looked like as he had his relief placed in stones. And here's the other characters we're going to be talking about. Uh, this plate deals with uh, the individuals, Tiglath Palasar the third or the Bible also calls him Pull, P-U-L. All scholars now agree that it's not that controversial. You'll, like anything, you'll find somebody out there that'll disagree, but uh, he's understood to be Pull. And the scripture references, the dates and scripture references are under each of the individuals. They're all found in 2 Kings 15, 17, 20, 18, 19, and then Asher Banner Paul. I 
didn't I forgot to put that uh, scripture reference in there. Well, we'll talk about that later. Um, here's a timeline. Tiglath Pelissar the third is here around 745 to 727 BC. And then you can see the others as they reign in sequence. And then above I've placed some of the prophets, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah. So that kind of puts it in the context of the prophets because they're talking about the, uh, the Assyrians and we're going to talk about his annals, which is the tablet right here, um, because he wrote his his history, his exploits, his his battles, his victories, and put it down in writing for us. And we can use that to compare with what the prophets were saying during that time period and get the parallel history. So that's its importance. Now, the annals were found in 1873 in a place called Nimrod um, by Sir, Sir Henry Laird. Photo of the individual here, that's his portrait. Uh, today, it's in the British Museum in London. And the significance is that it's the first known extra biblical reference of King Ahaz of Judah is mentioned in these. His name is, my trust is the son of Ishara. Tiglath Pelissar III is mentioned nine times in scripture. Here are the references here. Of course, we know that Kings and Chronicles are, are sort of duplicate documents. They tell the, uh, the same history in a little different way. And so there is the timeline here, the time frame. I put the kings of Israel on the top, and that's the northern kingdom, and then the southern uh, kings of the southern kingdom down here on the bottom of Judah. So it equals the time of King Ahab. Um, up in the north, you have uh, Menahem, Pekah, and Hosea. The history of the first 17 years of this king's reign number of the kings of Judah are mentioned, as well as Ammon, Moab, Ashkelon, Edom, Gaza, and Tyre. In the name of Jehoiahaz, king of Judah, as bringing tribute to this king as well. And he invades Israel when King Pekah is ruling in Israel. And he defeats his defeat of Rezin, king of Syria, is mentioned in scripture as well. And it mentions five Hebrew kings, Uzziah, Ahaz, Menahem, Pekah, and Hosea. So, you know, everything that's talked about in the Bible, all the kings that live, we find in these annals from the pers perspective of the Assyrian king as he rules and as he does his thing in Assyria and against Israel. He paid tribute to this king along with his son, uh, Pekana. The Assyrian king may have had a hand in securing the throne for Menahem. And so Hosea and Amos speak of the lawlessness and the sin within Israel during this time period. So Menahem continued worshiping the golden calf of Jehoi uh, Jeroboam in 2 Kings 15, this period led to the fall of the northern kingdom by the invasion of the Assyrians. So you can see how the Assyrian kingdom is intertwined with the kings of Israel. I have a map up here right now that we're going to take a look at. Uh, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, son, or came Tigapalassar, the king of Assyria, and took Iogen, that's up there in the north, and Abel Beth Makkah. Kind of interesting historical point here that our dig director, the assistant dig director at our site at Tel Hamam, um, has been digging up here at Abel Beth Makkah for a number of years. 
Um, I've not visited the site, but uh, Carol Cobes has worked there. Uh, they find a lot of interesting things up there in the north, uh, up in the uh, north North Galilee. I wouldn't recommend going up there now due to the war, but uh, they have been working there for many years. The next spot mentioned in 2 Kings 15 is Jayona, right there, and then Kadesh, Hatzor, and then, of course, Gilead. So these are all mentioned. And, of course, Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali. That's the yellow one there on your screen. And he carried them captives to Assyria. So this is the northern part of Israel that is um, being attacked, mentioned in Scripture. And you can see the different uh, cities uh, that he conquered. So he invades Israel. And the Assyrian text says, and in an Assyrian inscription, Tiglath-Pilassar likely refers to this event of the invasion of Israel, and literally the Omri land, because Omri is the, um, the land of Omri, because that was the one of the original rulers over the land. All its inhabitants and their possession I led to Assyria. So what's mentioned in 2 Kings is now mentioned in the Annals. And the inscription in, of this king says, Pika, their king, that is Israel's king, they had overthrown. I placed Hoshea over them. From him, I received 10 talents of gold and a thousand talents of silver. So he paid tribute to him. You know, give me money and I won't invade you. Give me money, I won't take you and carry you off to Assyria. And you can stay here under the king I appointed and live happily ever after. The Bible recalls from their from the biblical perspective, the people of the land of Omri. I deported to Assyria with their property, and Hosea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramallah, and smote him, and slew him, and reigned in his stead. So the Assyrian account says that Tiglath-Pelesar put up a, a king, Pekah, whereas the biblical account kind of gives behind the scenes uh, what happened uh, against him. Hosea came up, Shalmanassar, king of Assyria, and Hosea became his servant and gave him presents, paying tribute and booty again. So this is helpful because we have two different perspectives, two different accounts that can help us understand what's going on. Now, another interesting artifact from the Israel Museum is the called the Iran stele, Iran stele because it was found in Iran. And the inscription mentions payment of tribute by uh, Menahem, son of Gade, or Gadai, king of Israel, an event described in the Bible in 2 Kings 15. It was broken into three pieces, but subsequently acquired on the antiquities market in Western Iran. And that's why it's called the Iran records the events of his ninth year. Mentions Menahem bringing tribute, the king of Israel, to Tegoth Placer III. And it reads, the kings of the land of Hathai and of Arameans of the western seashore. Uh, the land of Hattai, um, Hattai is generally believed to be um, Anatolia, our modern-day Turkey, up in the north, uh, the Arameans of the western seashore, Menahem of Samaria. So another one is the Insulary Stele, and this one was found up in Anatolia, 
up here in modern day Turkey, discovered in 1993 by Elizabeth Carter of the UCLA. It was discovered in a farmer's garden and identified to belong to Tiglath Pileser III. It's displayed in the Museum of Archaeology in Turkey today. Gaziantepi. And it confirms the existence of Tiglath Palisar. And here it talks about as Gual, the great king of Assyria, as the Bible calls him Pol. So it uses the same name as Pol. So again, confirmation that the Bible is correct and talking about Tiglath Palisar III, now confirmed by another inscription. Here's a photograph of it, and here's a drawing that I did of it, of what he would have looked like. It was a boundary stone set up, and uh, three inscriptions. Luwian, that's the language that's found up in Anatolia, uh, Assyrian and Phoenician, but it was overwritten in Greek. So they had uh, put a Greek text over top of it, so it makes it difficult to read but they have been able to decipher it. They use a lot of uh, advanced visual technology. They can do different kinds of lighting and, and so forth, so they were able to read it. Tiglath Pelissar had two main campaigns, the first in 744 BC, and then the second in 737 BC. And this stella is found uh, is from the second campaign. Here's that beautiful chariot again. It's the bottom, the middle. So that's the, you know, it would take sort of what people are walking on in the sky above, and they would turn that into writing. And these are pretty much life-size. If you go to the British Museum today, they are, they are gigantic and just absolutely wonderful to see the detail in them. And the translation of the text says, I receive from Rezin of Damascus, Menahem of Samaria, Hiram of Tyre, again, gold and silver. So that was the money of the day. There's that beautiful relief again. I love it because you can see all the details of how all the horses were decorated and all the inscriptions. The Bible says, Pol, the king of Assyria, came against, invaded the land. And Menahem gave Pol a thousand talents of silver that he might help him to confirm his hold on the royal power. Menahem exacted the money from Israel, that is, from all the wealthy men, 50 shekels of silver from every man, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. So that's the historical background for the invasion found in scripture. And uh, the inscription says, as for Menahem, I overwhelmed him like a snowstorm. I like that as a Canadian. Yeah, it was a, it was invades him like a snowstorm, and he fled like a bird alone and bowed to my feet. I returned him to his place and imposed tribute upon him. You just sort of hear him saying um, from his perspective how he did the campaign and um, the Bible talking about uh, what they did. So that's the overview for tiglath Pileser the third mentioned in Scripture. And the confirmation we have. George, did you want to uh, go back to any of the uh, pictures or before I stop? Oh, no, I think, uh, you know, it, I, this individual in the in the biblical narrative really doesn't get a lot of attention. I think we go to Sennacherib during the time period of Hezekiah because of the artifacts at that time, such as uh, the Salome inscription in the tunnel, yeah. the broad wall. 
Um, and we'll get to that when we have time, when you get to that individual. Yeah. But it just uh, shows us uh, the number um, of, I, I don't want to use the word references, uh, but the crossing between the two cultures, how we can align them together. Um, and they agree. And in and, and this case, uh, sometimes there's variance. Then, you know, you get an opinion in the biblical narrative, and then you get a slightly different opinion that's recorded in the uh, uh, the Assyrian Chronicles. Yeah. And uh, that's to be expected because no, nobody's ever going to really want to talk about a defeat. No. We especially. Find that, I think, I think yeah, we find especially that in the, it, right, we find that with the Egyptians with the as well. And uh, their defeat, you don't want to talk about their... Uh, their defeat when it, during the Exodus, so that's why we don't find a lot of evidence there. But there's some little hints and clues around that uh, people suggest. But here the Assyrians give their version of events, and then we have the uh, biblical writers giving their version of events. So you have the two sides of the story. Um, as uh, I think it was the uh, the Quaker that said, "There's uh, there's two sides." There are three sides to every truth, my side, oh. your side, and, and the truth. So, And the uh, truth. <laughs> or they say between two rabbis, there's three opinions. Documents and um, how they parallel and, and um, intersect and interlock uh, with the Assyrian texts in the annals of Tiglath Palasar III. And that's true. I was just thinking of something, you know. Uh, Many people, a lot of people come out and they'll say something like, well, you know, what, what explains something using archaeology and artifacts? And people might say something like, you know, uh, my faith doesn't really need artifacts to prove it. I don't need artifacts to prove my faith. Sure. All right. But, sure. okay. But what happens when not, you know, archaeology can't prove everything. So there comes a time where we don't have evidence for that in archaeology. And the same individual that might say, well, I don't need, all of a sudden they're kind of like, they get upset. What do you mean? How can we not have it? It must be there. <laughs> I thought I thought that was not a requirement for your faith. You know, then if that's the case, then why so upset when it, there is no evidence, at least yet? for that now you know where i'm coming from i'm not trying to be mean but uh you know really it it, it does it does make it a, a i don't i shouldn't say it, it makes a difference but it's it's fun to have that evidence right and it can be very very simple like um the parable just the parable but the parables taking place in the time of the biblical narrative, let's say, of Jesus, the Roman period, and in the Jewish culture. So they have their own types of, let's say, there were five women, five wise and five foolish. They all had lamps, but we can get a lamp and say, well, this is a lamp from the Herodian period. It's a Jewish lamp. Why? No graven image. It's a very plain lamp. And you go, well, ah, that's pretty cool. That in itself, and it puts it to our mind what they were thinking 2,000 years ago, the image in their mind. It was their culture, their technology. Or how about the one where Jesus is being anointed, right? And a woman, a certain woman, it could have been Lazarus's sister, depends on sometimes the, 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 the gospel that you might read in that case, okay? But anyway, it talks about a certain vessel that is being used to anoint Jesus while he's at a banquet. All right? And what type of vessel was it? An alabaster vessel. Now, I don't know if it looked just like this, but this is a 2,000-year-old, at least 2,000-year-old, alabaster vessel. And they were used to store very expensive perfumes. 100% that's historical. We find them in tombs because bodies decompose. It doesn't smell good. Hence, Lazarus was been in the tomb for four days. You roll away the tomb, 
You shouldn't do that because he will stinketh. Some say that, King James, stinketh, or he might smell, right? Well, that's why we had perfume in the tomb. Sure. I think it's interesting. And, and not that we could, might make a connection with this, maybe not so much. Because when this woman breaks the vessel, Judas turns around and says, you could have sold this for a lot of money. You're wasting it. That's best what he's saying, right? And Jesus says, well, leave her alone. She's preparing me for my burial. I think within his statement, we have a little connection right there. But here, like you're doing with your PowerPoint, you're showing us actual artifacts that help us to understand in a very realistic fashion what is going on in the biblical narrative as well. Real people, real times, talking about it in their culture, the same event, but a different culture perspective. And we can do the same thing with archaeology as well, right? Fun stuff. Yeah. Just like that. Another point. That's all. Fun. I just happened to have them here because I was doing a, a small advertisement uh, using artifacts. So I had them here. But anyway, but uh, uh, granted, uh, a stone with Tiglath Palazzar on it would be a lot cooler than just an oil lamp. <laughs> yeah, well, they're a little larger. Uh, some of them are eight feet tall. So, <laughs> Well, if I have the opportunity, I'd say, well, maybe the British Museum, right? I'd say, well, if you guys want to trade. You know, I'm up for that, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to pay for shipping. <laughs> so, I'll pay for shipping. Maybe I get some donors and say, well, I think it'd be a good deal. Mm. But anyway, well, Dr. Graves, thank you very much for this presentation on Teglath Palazer. And, and it's the first of six. So we have five more to go. People, you want to stay tuned. We're going to attach these one at a time or just be too long. And, um, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, very educational. We're going to, of course, it goes into points uh, outside the biblical narrative to help explain, uh, you could say, the whole the whole event. And this is going to be fascinating. I learned a lot. I appreciate it. And I really thank you for your PowerPoint, your time and effort in producing these slides for us. Um, uh, it's really appreciated. And... Uh, also, uh, for the listening audience, I thank you also for your participation. I think we're now up to like 124,000 subscribers because of you. And um, tell your friends, uh, we got more coming up. Wow. We just edited. Okay. We just edited the uh, po the um, podcast with you. You were talking about uh, the city, the lost city of Livius. And then we had Dr. Scott Stripling. He was talking about Shiloh and the, uh, the, the building foundation, uh, which they're um, still doing documentation on, uh, being the tabernacle. Yes. And I think he said they're, they're crossing their eyes and dotting their eyes and crossing the T's. I think that's almost a quote from Dr. Stripling. So, and so and I, uh, I don't think it's out for publication yet. And then we had uh dean uh gary byers from trinity southwest and veritas university and he was talking about tell el hamam and the gate system the, the very unique gate, gate system that they uh, excavated at tell el hamam that's been edited it should be up pretty soon so people stay tuned uh if if it shows i think it's called three amazing discoveries Yes. I don't think I called it Three Amigos. I don't think I, di I didn't do that to you. I think it's still Three Amazing Discoveries, according to the, the slide that you uh, you uh, actually uh, made for the, uh, the uh, for the podcast. So that'll be up soon as well. Okay, okay, everybody. Once again, thank you for your time. Everybody have a great day. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you're at, or good night. I appreciate all your time and supporting uh, Bible Interact. This is Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down. Have a good day.